scripture does not affect our daily lives, then what makes us think that it is going to affect our eternal life? Yeah, yeah. Shalom, everyone. Welcome to this week's Living Torah. And as we get into continuing through the book of Devarim, you know, we're getting really close to the end of this year's Torah cycle and uh, starting all over again, as far as I know. But it, there's, there's a lot of things in the, in, in the scripture, in uh, the book of Devarim, that's like, I don't really understand that. Okay, well, we're going to get into that in just a few moments. Uh, this, this concept of if it, doesn't, uh, if it doesn't affect my daily life, then why do I think it, should affect, it will affect my eternal life? Or if it doesn't work here, then why am I thinking that it's, not, that it's going to work somewhere else? Okay? That, that's kind of like if your, your life is, is totally messed up, but I'm just going to move to a different house down the street, and that's going to make everything, you know, whatever hunky and dory is, uh, it, it's probably not, because you're going to take the same baggage with you. Uh, an acquaintance of mine uses this term regarding scripture and says it's the oldest book of wisdom. I, I can understand the use of the term, I'm not really a fan of it because the scripture actually reveals so much more to us than just wisdom. It is about restoration. It is about redemption. It is about our very life. There's so many things that, that, that scripture teaches us, but wisdom is actually one of them and a very important thing because, you know, let's face it today, uh, common sense it's almost extinct in uh, the in the the area, at least the the world that I live in. It seems like it's really on the endangered species list. And if we look back to Scripture, maybe we would find that if we're looking to it as wisdom for our daily lives, then it may not just affect our lives, but it may be this affects other people's lives. As I interact with, uh, with people that I am not sure if they've ever had a single thought outside of a bad religious experience of the Creator, who He is, the Almighty, uh, Elohim, uh, however, you know, whatever term or title you want to use here, but why is it? Why is it they've not had a, a, a thought or a question in their mind? It's because I personally feel they've never really met anyone whose life was relevant regarding Scripture. You know, they, they see people as, well, they're, they're going to church on Sunday, but then they see them on Sunday afternoon or, or Shabbat service on Saturday, but then they see them on, you know, on Saturday afternoon or, or in the... You know, in, in, at the restaurant or something, and their life is not matching up. And so if their life is not matching up with what is in the scripture, then the, basically their own lifestyle is making the scripture null and void to someone else. So we should be a people who are not just looking at the scripture, reading the scripture, but the scripture is becoming a part of us. It is a part of us and is directing our lives on a daily basis. Now, with that, we go to Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 21, verse 10. And the first words we read is, When you go out to war against your enemies, and you have Avhe, your Elohim, hands them over to you, and you take prisoners, and you see among the prisoners a woman who looks good to you, and you feel attracted to her and want her as a wife, well, then here's what you're supposed to do. You're to bring her home, shave her head, cut her fingernails, and change her clothes from her, her prison clothes to something else. I'm going to go out on a limb here and just think that probably no one listening to me has ever done this. Hmm, what's the chances? That you, you may have gone to war, but you, you know, the chances are that you, you brought, you know, you, you found a prisoner and decided that you really loved, loved her and wanted to marry her, uh, it probably hadn't happened. So, well, let's just go on to the next verses, because these verses don't mean anything to us. Absolutely wrong. What are these verses teaching us? Don't 
be led by your emotions. Now, we, we all understand that, all right? Uh, now, emotions are a good thing. Emotions are a gift of the Almighty. They're put into our very DNA. Those of us that grew up back in the early days of, uh, of Star Trek remember uh, Mr. Spock, Leonard Nimoy, who was, by the way, Jewish. And Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, uh, was a man who based everything in his life on logic. Well, he may have made a lot of right decisions, but he never had any fun doing it, okay? So emotion adds a level of enjoyment to us making right decisions, and the opposite side of that is a level of sadness and despair or whatever when we make the wrong decisions, so maybe we won't make the wrong decisions as many times. Yeah, that'd be a good thing. So this thing of not being led by our emotions I'm sure that we've all done that. You know, you see things on a television commercial. Uh, anybody that's ever watched an infomercial or as seen on TV. And you find out there's a whole, uh, there, there's in, in some stores, there's a whole section of as seen on TV merchandise. You, there's, uh, I saw a shopping mall one time. There was a store devoted to as seen on TV, which was filled with merchandise of people that didn't buy into the fact that they were playing on the emotion because they knew, because they had some logic, that what they're showing us on television is not how it's going to work at when we get it home. Oh, yes. And so if we deal, if all we do is, is make our decisions based upon emotion in life, what are we going to do? <laughs> we're going to have a really strange place that we have made to live in. Uh, it may, it, uh, yeah, I just, oh, I could go a lot of places here and I'm not going to go. So the scripture is telling us, don't be led by your emotions. Wow. As I'm recording uh, right now, tonight there will be the infamous debate, the presidential debate. Uh, talk about an emotional three-ring circus. There are people now that will base their decisions. I, this is not a political statement regarding either candidate or, or anything of that nature. There will be people that base their whole decision on emotion and possibly in days and weeks and years to come reap the consequences of those emotions. Now, speaking of bad choices, uh, verse 15, if a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, you know, I'm just kind of thinking that these verses really don't need to be here. I go back to the beginning for everything and see that in the beginning, he created Adam and Eve. It wasn't Adam and Eve's. There's no plurality there. Now, I understand that, you know, through the scripture, we have people like David and, and Solomon and, you know, various other ones. But show me a place, you know, Yaakov, uh, or, or yeah, Isaac, Itzhak. <clears throat> show me a place <laughs> in which this really worked out good. <sighs> Yeah, the Almighty can use our, our mistakes along the way, but I think it would be a lot easier if we cut down on the mistakes. And this one, as we read this, it talks about then the loved and the unloved wife and the offspring of those and how the, the firstborn was a child from the unloved wife and the others were, you know, from the unloved wife. And so when it comes time for the inheritance, you're wanting to give the, the double portion inheritance to the loved one. But no, no, no. The scripture is telling you that you're to give it to the firstborn. Well, I, I don't like that. It doesn't matter. See, bad choices should not affect other people. 
if, you, if we make a bad choice, try not to make that continue into someone else's life. Own it, and then do what is right in order to try to restore the bad choice that you made. Uh, next, next verses here is uh, verse 18, and talks about the stubborn, rebellious son. Now, this goes into an area of taking the child outside of the gate and stoning them. All right, uh, capital punishment. Uh, this, the scripture is, well, if we look at history, there's not a recorded time in which this was actually done. Of course, in our world today, this is illegal. At least in Western society, it is illegal. If you go into Muslim nations, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is done. People are killed, honor killing. Uh, people are killed for lifestyles, all of those things. We're not condoning this in any way uh, of breaking the law. Now, we could talk about what the law will be in the kingdom. That's a different thing. But for now, what do we, what, what do we, how do we look at this? That we should teach our children and those that are under our influence or affected by our influence, <clears throat> maybe a better way of looking, of, of, of uh, verbalizing that, that actions have consequences. The book many years ago from, uh, from Dr. Dobson, Reality, reality discipline. I think it was that was the the principle of it. I can't remember exactly the title, but he was teaching that we should, from an early age, we should be teaching our children that their actions have consequences. Because if you don't, what do you have? <laughs> you have today's society. There's a verse in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And I marked it, so I just turned right to it. I was, I'm not that good. And uh, this, this, this verse has intrigued me since the first time that I read it. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, uh, in verse 5, excuse me, um, verse 11 says, Because the punishment decreed on an evil act is not promptly carried out, therefore people who plan to do evil are strengthened in their intentions. Today, there is a lot of, uh, of, of talk regarding criminals that were allowed into the United States and how the, the percentage of crimes that are being, uh, that are, that are being done in, on, on American soil. I'm talking, talking just about here. Uh, this is kind of the, you know, this is where I live, so I see the news here. I don't know what might be happening in South Africa or, or Canada or somewhere else, but probably the same basic thing. So we see people that have been let into this country, have done criminal acts, are put in jail, and then are allowed to be out the next day or that night on a $1,000 bail or, or no bail at all. And, you know, your court date, because the, uh, because the court system is so backed up, is, you know, two, three years down the road. I recently had to uh, be on jury duty. It was never, never select. Well, actually, it was selected as an alternate. Every case was, was in, a, in a plea deal. But I was amazed at how long, in the, the, how long ago from that date these things had been committed. You know, there are, there are things that we read about on, or we, we saw in the news two, three years ago that have never come to trial. And it, it comes to trial, it's like, I can't even remember that happening. It's been so long ago. And wondering why there's no fear of people committing crimes because they know the consequences are not going to be anytime soon and I'll probably get off anyway. So this verse of Ecclesiastes, you want to stun somebody? In conversations, in just regular conversation with someone that is, is, uh, has, has no real thought of the Creator, in the, the Almighty in their lives, and 
you know, it's fun to guide conversations. It's very easy to do. Uh, it's uh, there, there's not a there's not a real art to guiding a conversation. It does take some thought, <clears throat> and it does take some. Uh, you know, you need to be prepared for where you're guiding a person to. But if you want to guide a person into a conversation regarding the crime rate in the world today and say, you know, there's a verse about that. And then be willing and able to quote Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 and watch them go, wow, I, I've never heard such a thing. And that gives you an open door into then speaking other things into their lives. Let's go to chapter 22. Uh, when you see you're not to watch your brother's ox or sheep straying and behaves, behave as if you hadn't seen it. Well, uh, I, I don't, you know, my neighbor doesn't have any ox, he doesn't have sheep, but he does have cows. And once in a while, Kathy and I will be out walking the dog and, uh, you know, we'll look over and we've had opportunities to see a, uh, a calf that's been born just, you know, moments really before we were there. Uh, we've had opportunities that the cows have been out of the out of the uh, the fence, and so what do I do? Pick up the phone, call Benny. Hey, Benny, cows are out. Okay, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I I've, I think I've talked to the guy in person one time. But he's like, man, you you are like the most amazing neighbor. Now I live in North Carolina, where when I'm talking about my neighbor, I can't see him out my window. Okay, I can't hear them. Uh, this neighbor actually is the next, one of the, you know, his, his, he owns over 300 acres and his house sits on the other side of that. So we don't have a lot of opportunity to just sit and chat with each other. But if I see his cows out, I have his phone number in my phone and I'm going to call him and tell him your cows out. All right. So don't turn your back on needs. And that, that leads us to another problem, I guess, is we need to be discerning of what is an actual need today. Anybody been through? Uh, you know, it used to be, when I was growing up, working at Winn-Dixie, we had a thing called food stamps. And it was really kind of a stigmatism in that day. People, I, if I end up having to run the register, which occasionally I did, uh, and, and somebody was paying with food stamps, they, they would kind of like, you know, try to make it to where nobody around them could see it. Now we have, then it came, became one card, and now it's just a Visa card. It looks the same as everything else. There's no stigmatism. But I can pretty much assure you that I can look at what a person's buying and tell you if they are using that kind of payment. There's no stigmatism along with it. And so, you know, somebody standing on a street corner with a sign that says, you know, we'll work for food, God bless. Is that true or not? A lot of uh, some of the rabbinic writings say you should help everyone because you never know what is true or not. I'm, I'm just not in agreement with that because if you, you know, how you, how you go about figuring out that, that need that's there. If a person is, you know, living in a hotel room every night after standing on a, on a corner, uh, and, you know, and they're standing there with a, with a big gulp in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand, I'm probably not going to help them. We need to be discerning, but never just turning our backs on needs. You and I, I uh, probably do not have unlimited income. If there's any of you out there that have unlimited income, you haven't told me yet, and that's okay. But uh, we probably all only have so many dollars that we can give to so many places. This is why when it comes to giving to Israel, uh, I don't just give to organizations. I give to people and places that I know specifically how that money is going to be used. One friend of mine 
uh, that I that we give through is very discerning. I mean, to the point of stingy with giving money out, and that's why I trust him to because it's you know it's my money, it's your money, and I want to give it to people who are trust I can trust to give it to the right places and not just you know squander it on something. So don't turn our backs on the needy. Uh, here's, a, here's a fun one for today. In verse 5, a woman is not to wear men's clothing, and a man is not to put on women's clothing. Uh, for whoever does these things is detestable to Yudhei Vav Heir Elohim. There are denominations and various uh, groups that would say, well, you know, uh, a woman is not to wear pants. Hmm. Uh, if we go back to the days of the scripture, nobody was wearing pants. They were all wearing dresses. Well, I guess we could call them robes, but it looks a lot like a dress to me. And so we, we need to put this in the context that this is not a specific, you know, style, but this is, uh, I, let's, let's, Let's look at it like this. You need to look like who you are. Mm, yeah, Look like who you are. And by the way, the Almighty is not confused. Um, the confusion that is today was not created by Him. We need to be who we are. And not only be who we are, but accept and embrace who we are. It's the old, uh, the old song from Mr. Rogers. You know, only, only boys can be the daddies, and only girls can be the mommies. So a woman is a, is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, uh, is a person who has a womb. A person who doesn't have a womb is called a man. Okay? Uh, men cannot give birth. Okay, uh, I, I don't need to go down this, this road anymore, I don't think, because probably all of us understand these things, but it is embracing who we are. Uh, think about your, your very, the dress, the, not the dress, but the way that you dress. The, there's a rabbinic statement that a woman or a man should be dressing and I'm going to butcher this a little bit, in a way in which at a certain distance, and I can't remember the certain distance, at dawn or at dusk, that they would be distinguishable as a man or a woman. So when someone looks at you, do they have to wonder? Do they have to take a second take? I mean, how many of us... I, I mentioned it again, Walmart parking lot, or, you know, going into the self-checkout, I'm expecting one day for them to be standing there telling me I need to stock the shelves now in order to be able to shop there. But how many have stood there in the line and looked at somebody and thought, I'm not sure what that is. And you walk out the door, and you still don't know what it is. Why? Confusion? Yes. But they're not embracing who the Creator created them to be. So whatever He created you to be, not just in your biological uh, uh, makeup, but as a person, be who you create or created to be and embrace that and make sure that others around you are able to see the uniqueness, not the, not the peculiarity, the uniqueness of who you are. Um, next, verse 6. This, this is funny because uh, I did a program last night with Alex, Life on Purpose, and <coughs> I had given him a, a text earlier in the day about four things that the Scripture teaches us. Uh, the, the four uh, of how to, and I'm not going to rehash this, you, you can listen to that program if you'd like, 
But how do we how do we walk in a biblical world view? Are there some things that the scripture teaches us? And I boiled it down to four words. Of course, we could go to a lot of other things, but four words of life, restoration, redemption, and reproduction. Life, restoration, redemption, and reproduction. Interesting enough, looking outside the window, creation teaches us those four very things. Excuse me. Creation will teach us about life, the seasons. It will teach us about life, restoration, redemption, reproduction, fruitfulness, okay? And so this, I, after I sent him this, I looked at, I was looking for the, the Torah portion for today, and here's the verse that I was thinking about. If you were walking along and happened to see a bird's nest in a tree or on the ground with chicks or eggs, and the mother bird is sitting on the chicks or the eggs, you're not to make, you're not take the mother with the chicks. You must let the mother go, but you may take the chicks for yourself so that things will go well with you and you will prolong your life. Hmm. Interesting. So what is this? This is known as in, in Judaism, this is known as the least commandment in all of scripture. But I would suggest that it is one of the greatest commandments in all of Scripture because it teaches us the concept of honoring life. How are we doing that? Honoring life. And of course, uh, if we look at the world system today, it is going totally against this thing of honoring life. Uh, it is probable that this, uh, or probable this election in the United States is going to be affected very highly regarding the argument that's in the United States on the honoring, <clears throat> dishonoring, or taking of life. So even if it is a little bird, we are to honor life. When I was uh, hunting with my granddad many years ago, he was teaching me to hunt. Uh, granddad was one that honored life. And we would go out dove hunting or, or quail hunting or, or tree rat, squirrels. Uh, that's back in, you know, didn't know any better, okay? But uh, I've seen granddad spend as much as a half an hour looking around for a dove or a quail or a squirrel that he shot. I mean, he wouldn't, he, he spent one time, uh, he was telling me a story, he spent one time two days looking for a deer, following the bloodline. He had to go home and then come back the next day and following that bloodline, <clears throat> I can't remember if he found the deer or not in the end, but it was a part of honoring life. I remember me out with my BB gun with, with granddad in the, those early days, and I'd see a sparrow, and I'd just shoot it. And then he never said anything to me about that, but uh, and, and eventually he would teach me that if you're going to kill it, you're going to eat it, okay? And so it doesn't matter if it's a tree rat. If you kill it, you're going to eat it. And so in, that, in him teaching me, though he didn't tell me not to shoot that sparrow, it kind of developed in my own life that if I'm not going to eat that sparrow, and there's, there's no way I'm going to, <clears throat> then maybe I shouldn't be shooting it. So I shouldn't be killing something that is just living. Okay, if something is destructive, you have a, a, a wild hog, and this is, a, this is actually a, a conversation that's going on in Israel. There are wild hogs all over, wild dogs also, and they're causing havoc. They, uh, we were actually in the vineyard one time over in Kedamim, or no, in Dolev, and there was a dead hog in the vineyard. I mean, we couldn't get anywhere close to this thing. And it's like, why not shoot them? They, they're still having that conversation of whether something that is destructive like that should be put to death or not. To me, I believe that when it comes to something destroying something else, that yes, 
there should be a consequence to that. Okay, another, another uh, place. Uh, let's, let's go to verse 8. When you build a new house, you must build a low wall around your roof. Otherwise, someone may fall from it, and you will be responsible for his death. This comes back to that thing of called common sense. Uh, we have two decks on our house. Uh, those decks are on the second floor. There is one area that it is about 10 feet to the ground. Well, it's, it was obvious the, to the, uh, the person that owned the house, that built the house originally, that uh, you should put a, a, a railing around that. Well, uh, eventually after we bought the house, I found a place that they had not secured that railing very well. Had a friend of ours that you know leaned over to onto that railing, and I it uh, it was like, wait a minute, sorry, back off, because it was to the point that you could, if you put enough pressure on it, you're going to fall ten feet. So, what did I do? I went out and fixed it to where it's not going to fall. See, these are common sense things. You dig a hole you should put some kind of a flag or tape or something around it. We should take responsibility for our actions that may affect someone else's actions. Okay, if, if I mean, for me, I don't personally like looking through a deck railing. We've got a nice view if we're sitting out on the porch, we've got a, a view of the woods down toward the river, mountains in the distance, but, and if it was just me, well, it, so what, okay? I, I, I know where the edge of the deck is. I may not need it, but we have the grandkids come over. They need the railing. In fact, there's code regarding that railing that keeps a child from putting, a, a small child from putting their head through that. That's what codes are all about. Uh, the very fact that we have building codes is probably because a lot of people have not used common sense along the way. Why do you have a cover over your outlet? Why do you put, when your children are small, a childproof thing there? Because maybe you're raising a son, like uh, our oldest son, who came to his mom and said, Mommy, I created fire. Why? Because he put the scissors in the outlet. Hmm. So we used a little extra common sense and put more childproof you know, things on there uh, with him. It was, it was like it was going to be challenging, but we're going to do whatever we can. Those are things of common sense. Verse 12. Uh, you are to make for yourselves twisted cords on the four corners of the garment you wrap around yourself. That today, we know that from, uh, from Numbers chapter 16, is the zitziot. Now, this has evolved through the years. I'm not sure exactly how it was done in that day, but it was to be a blue thread in the corners of their garment. Why? Because the, 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 court, the, the blue thread would remind them of who they were and possibly remind them of where they came from. Think about that. That if you have those, those and I use the, the ones on the belt loops, but if you reach for your keys, you feel those, those cords, those threads. Those a reminder. Do we need reminders? Well, I guess there are times, yes. I think the longer that we, that we are in a walk, but as at, at first, how many of you, you know, back in, the, back in the early days, how many of you found yourself standing in Walmart on a Saturday afternoon? How many of you sat down at a restaurant, you know? Well, let's just run by and grab something to eat. And you're sitting there in the restaurant and you're going, it's Shabbat. I forgot. As we walk it out, 
There should not be as many forgotten moments. But at the same time, still having that reminder, sometimes it's a sign for other people, but a reminder for ourselves of who we are, where we came from. You know, people that come to our house, we usually, you know, they come up to our office. We had some friends from Montana that came out uh, a few uh, few months ago, and they came up to my office. All this stuff behind me, that's a part of who I am. Okay, these are, these are things of where I came from. You see a picture of my mother, my grandmother, of my dear friend John. But it's, it's other things that really no meaning to you, but it is great meaning to me. The infamous grenade, <laughs> that is fake, uh, the complaint department, that was given to me by a very close friend uh, of blessed memory. The, on the other side, of, there, there it is, right there, a flashlight. That was my granddad's. I remember him. He'd, he'd, he'd hear something outside, you know, a cat or something. He'd grab his flashlight and his 12 gauge, and we'd walk around the house. It was cool. There was a, um, there's a banner right about there that was, uh, it's a, uh, a little banner from Australia when my dad was in the, uh, in the Coast Guard in the South Pacific on, a, on an LST ship. And so that's something he brought back. Uh, a model of a deer. I did that. I put that together for my granddad. Uh, there's a, a piece of pottery right there that I made in kindergarten, which reminds me that I have no real creative tech talent at all, and so I should not be doing those things. All right. So this is all about, and we should be. We should have things around us, the zit zit, and other things that are reminders of who we are, and reminders of where we came from. There's probably not much on, that sh on these shelves behind me that would be of interest to anyone outside of maybe my children. Some of these things they, won't, they wouldn't even care about. But these are things that are part of my life. So remember where you came from and remember who you are. Let's go all the way over to chapter 23, and the infamous verse that I used uh, when I was teaching preparedness many years ago is uh, verse 14 or 13, depending on your translation. You must carry a trowel or a shovel with your equipment, and when you relieve yourself, you're to dig a hole and afterwards cover your excrement, okay? Uh, I think this is a fun verse here. Because it is really common sense, but uh, how many people don't do that? I, 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 let, let's take it into modern society, okay? Because you know, most of us have indoor restrooms. Uh, let's take it into modern society, and you take your dog for a walk, and what do you got? You got the little bag, right? Now, we live in the country. Why? Because... I don't like to. I don't like the little bag. Uh, there's no reason for us to, to, you know, to be involved in that. But when Kathy takes Kaya for a walk on the uh, on the at the Greenway, she got a little bag. Okay, uh, what happens when you have a, a person that doesn't carry the little bag and doesn't use the little bag? You step in it. Now, I know this, this sounds a little, uh, a little crude, but see, the verse goes on to say that for Yud Vave your Elohim moves about in your camp to rescue uh, you and, your, and to hand over your, your enemies to you. Therefore, your camp must be ho a holy place. Hmm. I know it, 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 it's crude, okay, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because you remember it. Okay, there's some things you remember that we are to clean up our, after ourselves because he doesn't want to step in it. This is telling us that he is in our camps. So consider in our congregations. Are you leaving a mess? I'm not, I'm not talking about just a, a physical mess. I mean, I've, I've seen people that never clean up after their children. 
never clean up after themselves. Why? Because somebody else is going to do it. Take responsibility for your own actions, your own mess. But what about what that should teach us? Because the natural should teach us about the spiritual, the spiritual about the natural. That when we clean up our, after our own mess, that uh, say you you know you 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 went to the oneg, you figured out that oneg is not a blood type, and that's where we eat together. And so you you know you got your little plate, you got your silverware, you got all your stuff. You go to the table, you sit down and eat it. And you just get up and walk away. I've seen people do this. I've seen families that do this. Walk away because yeah, it's not my mess to clean up. And then that leads to other things. It leads to other messes that we leave behind. Somebody standing there gossiping about someone. What? What? Are you, are you sharing prayer requests? And then that becomes this, this downgrading of a person. And, and those, are, those are messes. Not understanding that the Almighty is there in our buildings. We got Sukkot coming up, okay? What about camps? Are you leaving a mess in your camp? Is your campsite being used as the local gossip session? Is there a sign out front that says, if you want to to gossip and talk bad about people, come here. And then the Almighty is walking around afterwards and he's having to step in our messes. Let's think about that. Now, uh, I'm going to go all the way over, to, uh, go over to verse 20. Um, hmm, where's that? It talks about interest. You're not to lend at interest to your brother. That doesn't say anything about lending an interest to someone that's not. What's that teaching us? We're to teach our fam we're to treat our family different. We, we, we should do that in our natural family. But shouldn't we also do that in our spiritual family? So you see someone in need that's in the congregation, maybe they you know got behind on a car payment. And so you're going to make their car payment from them and then charge them interest for that? Therefore, exacerbating the debt that they have. I'm not saying that we should, you know, well, I'll just pay your car payment and, you know, don't worry about it. No. See, actions have consequences, so they need to figure out the reason I couldn't make my car payment is because of this because I made an emotional decision which got me into a place that I'm in today. And so you and I should not just be arbitrarily getting people out of bad decisions which are kind of based upon uh, there's no punishment because there's no consequences as Ezekiel or as Ecclesiastes chapter 8 says. So we should not be uh, aiding in that. We should not be, um, what's the word? I can't remember the word right now. We, we should not be helping them in their bad decisions, but we should be helping them out of them. Okay? I'll give you the money. I'll loan you the money to make your car payment. But here's the... Here's the here here's the the um, here here's the details. Here this is what we're going to do regarding that. Here's our contract. First of all, I have to have an assurance and proof that you're making that you've made the car payment. I don't want it used on something else. Number two is you and I or someone else that has some type of, um, of experience in this, are going to sit down and discuss your budget. We're going to find out, why can't you make your car payment? And then we're going to set up a plan in order to make your car payment, and by the way, pay me back. Now this is going to cost me because 
This is money I could I could have interest, I could draw interest on, so I'm actually giving you something. But I'm doing so, not enabling, there's the word I was looking for, not enabling them to continue that, but to try to stop the bad decisions. I've sat down with many people through the years that have said to me, you know, I'm, I'm like hopelessly in debt. I can't pay my bills. It's just, it's racking up. We've got all these credit cards and, uh, you know, they, they, they don't have the, the time or the, the money to go through Dave Ramsey. Uh, not everybody needs to go through a financial course. I've sat down. I said, okay, bring me all your, bring me your income. Bring me a list of your debts. If you have credit cards, car payments, I want to know how many payments are left. I want to know the interest rate to the side of it. I want to know all these things. And have been able to help out many people regarding this. That all of a sudden, you know, they, it was just a matter of we need to get a hold on this thing. So don't charge someone interest. Don't, don't put them in a worse spot. But don't turn your back on the need either. All right, lastly, real quick. In verse 20, chapter 25, it says, uh, Remember what Amalek did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you by the road, attacked those in the rear, those who were exhausted and straggling behind when you were tired and weary. The verse there, the, the word exhausted is only used one time in all of Scripture, and it means shattered. Think about that. Those that are shattered. How many people do, do you know that have been shattered by religion? Shattered by hurt? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in contact with people, it seems like more and more these days, People that have been to the point of shattered by a bad religious experience. Been spending time lately teaching uh, with Life Assembly and in various places. I, I did the the word the, the chapter of Luke chapter fifteen, chapter of chapter yeah I shouldn't have said it like that. Chapter fifteen of the book of Luke has intrigued me lately. It's about a lost coin. It's about a lost sheep. It's a product about a lost, about a prodigal son. But see, there's a difference, and I'm going to be putting out a message in a couple of months regarding the difference between salvation and redemption. See, the lost coin, or the lost sheep, could have been returned to the pasture, but not to the flock. The lost coin could have been found but never returned to its purpose. The prodigal son could have been restored as a servant, but not redeemed as a son. You and I need to be looking for those who have been shattered, who are in our day exhausted, who are straggling behind, that we can reach out, lend a hand, Give them a message that is relevant to their daily life. Not just handing them a track about something in the so-called sweet by and by. If all you're doing is talking about a mansion over a hillside, but they don't know how to make the, car, the house payment on the one on this side of the hillside, maybe we need to look and ask ourselves, is our message relevant? Hmm. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, what was that? I'll get English down one of these days. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem. God willing. See you again next week. Until then, be strong. Ya er Adonai panavelecha v'yichunecha. 
Shalom.